Welcome to Munich, where a journey through the Bavarian and Austrian Alps begins, a tour of the rich cultural traditions of the region. In this two-part series, we travel across a scenic part of Catholic German-speaking Europe, best known for its commitment to Lebensfreude, the art of enjoying life, and experience the region's exuberant lifestyle for ourselves through its vibrant street life, rich cuisine, lively entertainment, and passionate show of faith. So join us, I'm David Saldran, and this is executive class. Lebensfreude, the joy of living, it's a theme that brings me back to Bavaria. This time around, I'm exploring the region with the global experts in guided holidays, Trafalgar. I'm taking part in their Sound of Music tour, a guided holiday named after the popular Hollywood musical that was inspired by and filmed in the Alpine cities and countryside of Germany and Austria. Our tour begins in Munich, the capital of Bavaria. Every Trafalgar journey begins with a welcome dinner. We've done it so many times in the past, and yet I still always look forward to it. This is where strangers, strangers like these, become friends at the end of every trip. Frost! 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 We're great trip! Munich is Germany's third largest city, but also its wealthiest and with the highest quality of life in the country. No wonder locals enjoy life here so much. Their city is blessed with so many parks and palaces, museums and monuments, and some of the most magnificent and historic architecture in Germany. It's awesome, isn't it? Looking at the view from the tower of the new Rathaus, it's hard to believe that Munich was devastated by bombs in World War II. But the residents love their city so much, they've reconstructed it to look like the original. The reconstruction was done so well, it's hard to tell what's old, what's new. Especially in the old town, the historic heart of the city where the story of Munich begins. This medieval church here, St. Peter's Church, is the oldest church in Munich. And if you're wondering where the word Munich comes from, or München in the local language, it's from the word monk. That's right, monk, because monks did play a huge role in this city. München means the home of the monks, and literally, it was. It was founded by the Benedictines, who established a market not far from where the church is. The monks brought trade and a Christian faith too, a tradition that survived along with the splendid churches of the city. It's a respect for tradition and a fondness for the past that have helped define Munich's streetscape and skyline. There's this element of make-believe in Munich that's really so captivating. It's almost like the rulers built their city based on their own fantasies and dreams. Take this building over here, the new rat house. It looks like it's from the Middle Ages, right? But it's actually pretty new. It isn't older than 200 years. The new town hall on Marienplatz, Munich's central square, is the most famous landmark of the city. The neo-Gothic brick building was inspired by the city's golden age, in the late Gothic period of Germany. Even the glockenspiel, a medieval invention to mark the time of day, is just over a century old. The mechanical instrument of 43 bells retells a number of events and legends in Munich's history. The rulers of Bavaria installed it for prestige and public entertainment, which it still achieves today. 
I really love looking at this building. It's the new Rathaus of Munich. And if you take a closer look at the facade of the building, you'll see these figures, these statues of men. Now, these are the members of the Wittelsbach ruling dynasty, which according to history books, is the longest ruling dynasty in Europe, an unbroken one at that. And that part explains a very strong Bavarian identity. Indeed, it's hard to ignore the influence and imprint of the Wittelsbachs on the character and culture of Munich. Everything from their preferred choice of entertainment to architecture, and especially religion. The Twin Towers of the Frauenkirche is another iconic landmark. No building in the old town is allowed to stand taller than Munich's late Gothic cathedral. Damaged heavily by Allied bombing in World War II, the interiors are surprisingly simple and bare, more so for one that's also the seat of the powerful Roman Catholic archdiocese. Pope Benedict himself, a native Bavarian, was once the Archbishop of Munich. Unlike other parts of Germany after the Reformation, Bavaria, or at least southern Bavaria, remained predominantly Roman Catholic. And it's a very important thing if you want to understand the unique Bavarian character and identity. Again, credit the Wittelsbach rulers for this. Those like Holy Roman Emperor Louis IV or Ludwig of Bavaria, who are honored and buried here. More Wittelsbachs are interred in the crypt beneath the church, including those who lost their royal status when the last Bavarian king abdicated after Germany's defeat in 1918. 1927, 1919, these were the Wittelsbachs who were no longer in power after World War I. But look here, Koenig, King Ludwig III, the last king of Bavaria, buried here. Germany and Bavaria have been democracies since the aftermath of World War II, but the 700-year legacy of the Wittelsbachs lives on in the former capital of the royal dynasty. If many call Munich Italy's northernmost city, well, that's because Bavarian dukes and kings since the 17th century have tried to fashion their capital after those in Italy. The Schloss Nymphenburg, built as a summer palace, is one of the many grand structures done in Italian Baroque style. A favorite of the Wittelsbachs, succeeding generations of dukes and kings expanded the palace and built new wings. There was nothing unusual with royal families building multiple palaces, but the Wittelsbach dynasty took it to an entirely different level. The Nymphenburg Palace behind me, for example, is one of those examples of their extravagance an extravagance and an edifice complex that would eventually lead to the family's ruin. King Ludwig II, the eccentric ruler who built his fairy tale castle, Neuschwanstein, in the Bavarian foothills, was born in Schloss Nymphenburg. His building spree and those of his predecessors before him would give the world one of the most elegant Baroque cities outside Italy. This man behind me, Maximilian, was the very first king of Bavaria. Before that, the Wittelsbachs were dukes and electors of Bavaria. And to announce himself on the world stage, what did he do? He built for himself and for his people a grand opera house. The National Theatre is a home of the world-renowned Bavarian state opera. The sprawling public square, the Odeonsplatz, is lined with buildings of Italian high Baroque design as well. The Theatina Kirche, an ornately decorated Catholic church, along with the residence, the royal palace, and the Feldernhalle, the field marshal's hall, all evoke the southern style preferred by King Ludwig I, who stands above the square. Another Wittelsbach legacy on display in Odeonsplatz is luxury. The Bavarian dynasty developed their own brand, the Nymphenburg Porcelain Manufactory. The family no longer owns it, but the shop in Odeonsplatz showcases the traditional craft, once the exclusive luxury of royals and aristocrats. 
more Bavarian luxuries await on Brennerstrasse, a high-end shopping street off Audiensplatz. Upscale shops like Steiff, the German plush toy maker and inventor of the teddy bear as we know it, founded in 1880. And Ed Meyer, shoemaker based in Munich since 1596, the oldest in Germany. Now managed by the 14th generation of the Meyer family, they continue to sell their iconic handcrafted brogues, loafers, and patented pediform designs to generations of clients around the world. Ed Meyer allows you to walk in the shoes of the Bavarian kings, and I mean that literally. See, these shoes, some of these were made for the Bavarian kings of the past. In fact, they even have the lasts in their archives. Another luxury stop on Brennerstrasse is Café Lutpold, named after the Prince Regent who ruled shortly over Bavaria in the early 20th century. The elegant coffee shop in a grand heritage building is a Munich institution, a favorite watering hole of high society. Don't forget to try the house specialty, named after Bavaria's Prince Regent naturally. Before the Great War, Munich, under Prince Regent Luitpo and the last Wittelsbach king, Munich in the early 20th century was a magnet for liberal thinkers and artists. That was before the Great War and the infamous rise of the Nazi party in Munich in the 1920s. I'm here in Schwabing, which was known as an artist colony outside Munich. And I'm here to meet my guide who's gonna show me around this very interesting Bohemian district. Hello. 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 Nice to meet you. So this is Schwabing, right? Yes, this is Schwabing. And um, what I know about Schwabing is that this is where the artists used to live. And why did they come here? They came here because life was very liberal. We had liberal rulers here, our former ruling family. They supported art. Uh, they had a kind of family hobby collecting works of art. They supported them even. So they could do things that they couldn't do hardly anywhere else in the world in those times, around 1900. Schwabing was the home of the country's avant-garde movement. And Jugendstil, German modernist architecture, originated in the district. Yeah, color was very important in this mm -hmm. time. Jugendstil was the first modern thing that we got here. It's completely different from the 19th century. But then a group of young painters, uh, yeah, painters from all over Europe, they got together. And the most famous one, I think, was Vasily Kandinsky. Of course, Kandinsky. Vasily Kandinsky and the Blue Rider movement of Schwabing were also the first to introduce abstract art to the world. Despite their penchant for high art and luxury, the Wittelsbachs endeared themselves to the rest of society. In 1828, King Ludwig opened up his royal brewery, the Hof Brauhaus, to the public, a move that gave birth to Munich's world-famous Oktoberfest tradition and Bavarian beer-drinking culture. Prost, David. Prost. That's Prost. right. You like my German? Your German is very good. That's cheers, right? That's right. Anyway, Prost. Mmm. Ooh, wow. Mm -hmm. Now, before I ask you about this beer, yes. I have a much more basic question. Why are you guys so obsessed with beer? What is it about Munich <laughs> and the beer culture here? It's a very, very long tradition. Okay. I mean, this house here was founded 1589. No very way. long time. Wow. They started to brew beer in here. And beer was, was not only considered, you know, it's not about the alcohol so much. Okay. Of course, that's a nice effect. Yeah. But in former times, it was considered as food. It's nutrition. Exactly. Oh, okay. Right. And the second thing we like in Bavaria very much is the so-called Gemütlichkeit. Okay, it's that's hard to say, but what is it? Gemütlichkeit is... Gemütlichkeit, whatever. You're in company, it's cozy, it's nice, you meet people, you listen to music. Gemütlichkeit. That, along with Levis Freude, described the Bavarian spirit accurately. And there are a few better places to experience it than in a beer hall such as this. Well, that and the intoxicating effect of the local brew called Helles, a 
light golden wheat beer. I still can't get over it. This is how big the mugs are here. Is this, yes. this is the extra large version or this is the no, regular no, no, no. version? <laughs> this is the small version for you. This is the small version? No, no. This is called Mas. This is one liter of beer. When our Trafalgar holiday continues, we'll say goodbye to Munich and take the so-called romantic road across the Bavarian countryside through stunning alpine scenery, fairy tale castles, charming three-dimensional painted villages, and spectacular Rococo surprises.